Okay, we're doing skull. Let me, let me list all the skull bones. A lot of bones in the skull. I just like the skull in my app. Look at that. Singular structure, but if I explode it, look at all those bones you gotta know. This is how they're organized. <laughs> Skull. It's composed of 22 bones fitted together. There's two basic regions of the skull, cranial bones and facial bones. Cranial bones, I'll just list them. They, I'll go over all of them and list them. They include frontal bone, frontal bone, you got one. Two parietal bones, One occipital bone, and those three people call you know the skull cap. The anatomy word for skull cap is calvaria. Calvaria. Skull cap. But cranial bones also include the temporal bones. So you got two of those, your temples. One sphenoid and one ethmoid. Facial bones. You have one mandible, your jaw, your lower jaw, your upper jaw are um, your maxilla, and you got two of them. Your zygomatics, your cheekbones, you got two of those. Uh, nasal bones, which form the bridge of your nose. Nasal, two nasal bones, very small bones called lacrimal bones. Those are the smallest bones of the skull, we'll show you those. They're inside your eye socket. Palatine bones. Palatine bones, you got two of those. Uh, vomers, inside your nasal septum. Yeah, one nasal septum, one vomer, and inferior nasal conchi. Inferior inside the nasal cavity. Inferior nasal conchi, spelled C O N C H A E. Got two of those. Cranial bones, facial bones. I don't have time to cover them all today. I'll do the cranial bones. I always start with those. Now the skull is useful. Well, I mean, as an, in an anatomy class, we go through bone by bone. You have to be able to name them, identify them, know all the sur surface features. But the skull is useful for when it's put together, right? That's how it's useful to us. We don't take about our skull. You don't. The only joint that moves is pretty much your jaw, so you can chew food. And uh, the skull is super important. It contains the brain. Calvaria. covers the brain, simply put, and people pretty much knew that, and it sits, the brain sits on top of um, what's called the cranial base. It 
is on, it's called the cranial base. Let me see if I can show that to you. Take a superior view of the skull here. I'm going to hide a couple of parietal bones here. So you see how we're looking down under the skull? That's a superior view of the cranial base. The brain sits on top of that. If I throw in nervous, well, there's the brain. It, it covers that space. It, it's The brain is sitting in that space. So the calvaria is basically your brain case. That's a superior view of the cranial base. So you should write that down. Study it. Study this view of the cranial base is what I'm trying to press upon you. What's, op what's the opposite of superior? Inferior. Inferior. What does that look like from underneath? There's the cranial base from underneath. Looks different, so I'll study that too. I want to hide the jawbone. Helps to remove the jawbone to study the cranial base inferiorly. We can study our skulls that way. Uh, no, let me get one. I'm going to squeeze by you guys here. We have real skulls and fake skulls. I got a fakey here. Study the superior view. Study the inferior view. With the mandible removed. In our skulls, how they're arranged, you can look at them in the lab. This is the skull cap, the calvaria. Okay. You can remove that with the bone saw. And you can study the cranial base from the superior view or the inferior view with the mandible removed. So here's the mandible. So usually there's three pieces to the skull. Mandible, skull, and skull cap. So how you do this is you take a bone saw. A bone saw um, has a diamond cut blade and the diamond cut blade oscillates. Okay, I think they have ones that are circular, but the one I use oscillates, and it's, it's not supposed to cut soft tissue. It's only um, supposed to cut hard tissue. I've seen people demonstrate it where they, they turn the saw on, they go like that to demonstrate it doesn't cut through your skin. I would never do that. I don't trust it, but it's not supposed to. So you just go 360 degrees. I, I gotta remove the scalp, peel that back. Sometimes I peel it forward. Um, there's some muscles here I gotta sweep off. So the only thing that's exposed is the skull, the hard bone. And you just cut all the way around and you just kind of take a, a hammer and chisel and just to kind of pry it, pry it loose. And you just take it off, okay? Um, and ours are prepared like that with the calvaria sawed through so you can study the cranial base. Um, but the skull's important for other reasons besides being the brain case. sensory organs. We'll get into it. I've been teaching sensory function, but just kind of like somatic sensory, visceral sensory, but then there's a category of senses the books always call the special senses. And they are special, which include vision, seeing, right? Um, smelling, 
um, balance and equilibrium, right? Pairing, taste. You know, these bottom three, remember I, uh, when I gave that neuron lecture, I mentioned the hair cell, remember that? Has no axons, no dendrites. We'll talk about the hair cell more when I talk about those special senses, but that, that's, those are like the last lectures I give in this class, but that, that's it. And then also, you know, it has a way to get to your airway and your food way. Orifices leading to airway and um, food way. Well, pretty much the trachea and the esophagus, and you learn those in 431. But it's all it's all in the skull. Okay, let's start with the frontal bone. Um, some bones you should be able you should be able to identify any bone in the skull, whether it's in the skull or disarticulated. Okay, just just like you know when you study the, the skeleton for other things, it's the same thing with the skull. I'm saying study individual skull bones, okay? Be able to identify them in the skull or disarticulated. ID in a skull or disarticulated. I want to go to the back of the room and show you our, you can see all our skulls on the shelf. Those are the kind of articulated ones, and the disarticulated ones are over here. up and oh nice ooh sphenoid ooh mandible ooh maxilla it's like a box of seeds candy oh there's another level oh wow look at that uh, parietal uh, frontal uh, so you get the idea study them disarticulated because we have them I would say the ones you should study are disarticulated, the larger ones, like frontal, I don't want to miss any, let me look at my list, parietal, occipital, temporal, sphenoethmoid. Mandible maxilla. Uh, yeah, that's good enough. The, the larger one. So the other ones are small. I just kind of be able to ID them in the skull, but not disarticulated. Now, our bone boxes here that are dis disarticulated skulls, they got everything. And some parts are missing, as you'll see. And, well, we don't like that. Try to try to keep the, the bone boxes 
for our skulls as complete sets. Okay, so I mean that's the frontal bone highlighted in the skull. What I like about the app is I can just isolate it. Isolate, bam. Part of your head is that. Just your, your forehead, right? Pretty much. You start with the frontal bone. That's what it looks like. Disarticulated. Frontal bone, and there are surface features. And yeah, I like the app, it kind of features the different surfaces and surface features we like students to know in, in any anatomy class. And um, what's highlighted in purple is most of the bone. It's not all the bone, it's most of it. That, that's your forehead. It's called the frontal squamous of the frontal bone. So surface features include frontal. Um, uh, your forehead. What we call your forehead. The frontal bone also includes part of the rim of your eye orbit, which is the bony rim around your eye socket where your eyeball is inside. I got it highlighted in purple. It's kind of like the top of your eye socket. It's called the supraorbital margin. Know that. It's like your superior bony eye orbit. That's how I would describe it. part of your bony eye orbit rim. Just the name itself is it describes it supra orbital margin, right? Then you have a little notch, a little notch right there. So what's in purple, there's a little notch on the medial aspect of that margin called Superorbital notch. Now it's variable. It could be a hole in some people. In other people, it's just a notch, not a hole. So it depends on the skull you're working with. You just gotta look on your test. Just just look. Students always ask me, well, "What do I call it on the test?" Call it what you see. Oh, on this one, it's a notch. So I'm gonna put notch. So what do you think you're gonna get if you put form in? I'm gonna mark it wrong because you didn't identify it right. Put what it is, not what it is not. Superorbital. Remember that's the anatomy word for hole, or if it's not a hole, just more often it's gonna be a notch, I think. I, I don't know, I, I never took an inventory. But anyways, that notch is important. There's stuff that passes by there. Um, there's a, a nerve called supraorbital nerve that passes by that notch. See how those uh, nerves passing by the notch? Supraorbital nerves. by here. Okay. Now those nerves, they help you feel your upper face. Help you feel. They have a sensory function. These nerves basically are a branch of the frontal nerve. The frontal nerve is a branch of a cranial nerve. V1, cranial nerve 5, the first division. Branch of V1. Note that for now. I want to cover the cranial nerves. Cranial nerve 
the one. I'll get to it. But anyways, I want to mention them here in this lecture because you're, I'm going to go through all the cranial nerves in a couple of lectures and I want you to have some background information. For now, just note that structure. Be able to identify the notch, know the nerve that passes by there. Um, and I also have something called the anterior cranial fossa. So I'm going to go back to my frontal bone isolated. I'm going to go look on the inside there. I'm going to go to surfaces, parts. I'm going to highlight that. See right there what's in purple? So that's on the inside of your forehead. What is on the inside of your forehead? Don't think too hard. Your brain. So that is a surface that supports your frontal lobes, anterior cranial fossa. You know, you think you're going to go like this. In your frontal lobe, that's kind of where you do your critical thinking. Now, AE, because there's two of them, right? E pluralizes it in anatomy, supports frontal lobes. Now, I haven't taught brain yet. I mean, those are of the brain. Interior cranial fossa. There you go. I think I saved a picture of that. See that? See how I got the front of bone there, and your brain's like. It's a very disturbing way to look at your, yourself, but um, we all look like that if you did the dissection. The brain's right on the inside of your forehead, supporting the frontal lobes. Uh, okay, I'm, I'm going to go back. Let me turn off nerves. Well, anyways, done with the frontal bone. Any questions on frontal bone? Yeah, that's a good one. Let's do the parietal bone. I'm going to isolate one on one side. Not much to look at. It's just a curved, four-sided bone, pretty much. Okay, I put it back in the skull. That's what it looks like in the skull, in the anterior view. You can't see much of it. It forms much of your lateral skull there. If I select both of them and then hide them, you can see how much of the top of the skull it makes. Okay, so that's what it looks like with two parietal bones missing. Reset. Isolate. Well, what I think you ought to know is um, the bones fitted together, the name of the joints are called sutures. Um, joints are immovable joints. They don't move. They're bound together by tough fibrous tissue. And they don't allow movement. Now, when you're born, that's not the case. They're, they're not fused yet. There's something called the fontanelles. There's cartilage that fills the space between some joints. Um, in an infant. Fontanelles is cartilage before skull bones fuse. I'm writing fontanelles, cartilage in between skull bones. Before they fuse. 
That gives the um, skull a little bit of compressibility for the birthing process. But the reason why I mentioned sutures is, I want you to know the sutures, the names of the sutures that the, that the parietal bone forms. And those are listed on your study list as well, suture. So parietal bones. Well, they all form sutures, but these sutures have names I want you to know. One is called the, the squamous suture. The squamous suture. If you look, um, it's forming the squamous suture inferiorly with the temporal bone. Let me do this. Let me kind of just draw here. Let me take my two-dimensional pen and just draw that border there. Then there's that border there, that border along the top, and that border along the front. The squamous suture is the one on the bottom right here, SQ, squamous suture. It's forming a joint with the temporal bone, okay? Um, next on your study list is the coronal suture. Remember, coronal also means frontal in that plane. Okay, so that's the one in the front. Frontal um, or coronal suture, I'll put CO up here. Front, front. Coronal suture. That's with the frontal bone. The one posteriorly is called the lambdoid suture. Put an L for lambdoid. That's the suture back there. So the parietal bone forms the lambdoid suture. With um, the occipital bone. And the one right in the sagittal plane, up top here on my figure, put an S, A, that, that's the sagittal suture. Now the sagittal suture, basically you're forming that with the other temporal bone. I mean, yeah, other parietal bones, sorry, he spoke. Other parietal bone, there you go. Okay, so know the, know the sutures, basically. Now, it's easier to do in the skull. I guess the trick is if I kind of get rid of it. And then if, I, if you're showing the bone in isolation, could you do it? Okay. Could you tell which suture is which side? Also note, see these little lines, those two rainbow lines? I'll highlight one of them. That's the inferior temporal line. There are superior inferior temporal lines. Those lines kind of mark where a muscle called um, temporalis um, attaches to. It originates there. So note those. Superior inferior temporal lines. muscle originates here. So I'm to put the bone back in the skull. You can see those lines there, and I'll fill in muscles. Here it is, big old temp 
temporalis muscle, creating those lines. Yeah, that's your like major chewing muscle. It's hard to see, but that muscle inserts on the mandible. So and it helps you close, you know, your jaw. So if you observe a person with a shaved head chewing, you should see that some movement there. That muscle contraction. You can feel it in your own skull. You clench your jaw, you can feel temporalis muscle flexing on the side of your skull. Not a muscle you normally flex to show off. Um, okay, occipital bone, I'm going to remove muscles. I'm going to isolate the occipital bone. Well, let me fade others. See that? There's, there's the back and the side. Occipital bone. <laughs> well, the occipital bone forms the posterior skull in the base of the skull. See that? forms the posterior and the base of the skull. Um, I'm going to isolate it and show you some of the surface features you should know. It looks like a seashell, kind of. It's been described like that. And if you look um, inferiorly, Right there, what's in purple, I've talked about this before when I gave the vertebral column lecture. Those articulate with C1, and those are called the occipital condyles. <laughs> so you still need to know that joint. The lateral occipital joint allows ES movement. So, and those are the condyles you should be able to identify. If you look posteriorly, there's a bump right in the middle, right in the back. That's called the external occipital protuberance. You can feel it back of your skull, a little bump back there. Occipital protuberance. We studied that before. That's one of the attachment points of trapezius. Trapezius. Okay, I'm going to go back underneath to the occipital condyles. If you look by the condyle, there's a little hole right next to it there. So there's the condyle. See that hole right above it? Yeah, making it so you can't not see the hole. That is the hypoglossal canal. You got two of them, there's one on each side.
Does hypo mean above or below? below? It means below or less than. What does glossal usually refer to? Does anyone know? Tongue. Tongue, yeah. It means below the tongue. Um, these canals al allow a cranial nerve to exit. Okay, one of the things that will drive you a little crazy about cranial nerves is, well, why are they called cranial nerves? They exit the cranial base. So they have to get out of the skull to innervate things in your face. And so this is one of those exit points. Hypoglossal nerve, um, cranial nerve 12, exits here. It's a nerve that I'll, I'll teach you later. It helps you move your tongue, tongue muscles. Hypoglossal, let me, I think I have a picture of that. on nerves. So I just have occipital bone with the nervous system. I'm going to zoom in. What I want you to see. That is the hypoglossal nerve, cranial nerve 12, exiting that canal. Okay, I just want to give you a sense that things exit here. Okay, and um, it's good to start knowing this now. There's also what's called the posterior cranial fossa. The posterior cranial fossa. I'm going to hide the nervous system, isolate the bone again. Highlighting it on one side, then for the other side. But what's in pur purple on one side is the same as the other. That's what I mean by the posterior cranial fossa. They support the cerebellum. Cerebellum, oh, I'll get to it. It's known as the behind brain. It's behind and below, and it sits in that space on the base of the skull called <clears throat> post, um, the posterior cranial fossa. So I'll give you a better sense of what I mean by that. I think I did do the cranial fossa here. I'm showing you the occipital bone with the brain inside, and see those brown structures on the bottom? Let's see if I can highlight them here. Let's highlight it in green now. That's the cerebellum. It's responsible for motor coordination and um, kind of sits in that space there on the occipital bone. I want to move on to the temporal bones. Are you not going to go over the Oh, that's the biggest one. All right, let me go over it. What does the term foramen magnum mean? Magnum, you think that means big or small? Big. And foramen means? Hole. Hole. Big hole. Bam. Do you see it? Let me see. It doesn't let me highlight it, really. It's between the condyles there. And uh, the brainstem spinal cord goes through there. 
Uh, that's an important one. Boring. Now the brainstem is continuous with the spinal cord. We're going to learn the brainstem has three parts. The most inferior part of the brainstem exits there. It's called the medulla. So specifically, what's going through there is pretty much medulla. I mean, the big hole. Frame and magnum, know that. And now, let me show you. Next bone. I'm going to put that bone back in the skull. I'm going to reset and get rid of the nerves. And basically, temporal. I'm going to do multi selection. I'm going to highlight the temporal bone on both sides. You got a left and a right. There's two of them. I'm going to fade others so you can kind of see where this bone is in the skull. Lateral skull. Okay, but if you kind of look above, do you see how there's a part of the bone that kind of sticks in? Right? So let me um, isolate one bone. Try to study it. That's from the anterior view, that's from the lateral view, inferior. It's a very irregular shaped bone, and it has different regions. That top blue part is the... Uh, well, the squamous part of the temporal bone. It's organized into different regions. And uh, it's the squamous region, highlighted in blue. Now, in that region, there are some surface features you should know. There's a little bar that goes forward, and it's called the zygomatic process. I'm going to highlight that in blue right there. So what's in blue, you got to know that little bar, zygomatic process. Now that process will articulate with the zygomatic bone, okay? sense. So when I get the zygomatic bone, I'm going to say the inverse. The zygomatic bone has a temporal process that articulates with the zygomatic process. Okay, so I'll give you a little preview there. So the temporal bone has a zygomatic process that articulates with temporal process of the zygomatic bone. So you just kind of name it for what the other bone that it articulates with. Also know in this region, mandibular fossa. That little depression, you can't see it there. There's an inferior view where that purple thing is, is the mandibular fossa. It accommodates the mandibular condyle of your jaw, so your jaw has a pivot point to go up and down. Go like this. And when your jaw moves up and down, it's pivoting in that little fossa. Mandibular fossa. The mandibular condyle 
fits in this fossa. The uh, anatomy to know. Let me, let me see if I can show you that. <clears throat> yeah, it is. So I'm highlighting the part of your jaw. I'm close up, but when I said mandibular condyle, the condyle is the thing that sticks up into it. So you see that a fossa is a depression. So the, the depression, if I have you identify it, is the mandibular fossa, but the condyle is fitting right in there. Okay. And that's good anatomy to know, because when you put away the skull, you have to do that. Right? So okay, how do I put this thing away? Oh, I have to attach the jawbone to where the mandibular condyle is supposed to be. Oh, okay. Yeah, okay, it goes like that. Students always put it away wrong because they don't think about it. But I want you to think about it because you're supposed to know it anyways. The condyles go in the mandible so it looks nice and proper and you can put it back. Okay. Um, all right, so the tympanic region of the temporal bone. I'm going to isolate temporal bone again. Here's our side view. And um, I'm going to highlight that ear hole. Okay, it doesn't let me highlight it anymore. Well, anyways, that's the tympanic region. What's in purple? The tympanic region. surface feature I want you to know is that ear hole, well it's hard to see with the purple on. I'll just zoom in on the hole. The hole in that region is your ear hole. It's called the external <coughs> auditory meatus or sometimes called the um, external acoustic meatus. External Stick. Meatus. It's kind of a, a bony passageway that leads to your, your tympanic membrane. Bony passage to tympanic membrane. Your eardrum. The tympanic membrane is a membrane, and on the other side of it, there are bones called the auditory ossicles. I'll teach those in the ear lecture. They're super tiny bones, and they vibrate. They vibrate at whatever frequency this membrane is vibrating at, whether it's treble or mid range or bass, and they'll amplify that signal to the inner ear structure where the nerves are. So that'll be part of the ear lecture. But just know that meatus right there. It's part of the external ear. External acoustic meatus for that region. You pull back. If you pull back, there's a big bump behind your ear in the mastoid region. What's in purple is the mastoid region. If you feel behind your, your actual ear, there's a bump behind it. That's this region, basically. Now within that purple region, that little process, the bump behind your ear I just had you feel, is called, called the mastoid process. I want you to know that. A little bump right there. The mastoid process is where the sternocleidomastoid muscle uh, inserts. So is the mastoid process just 
No, it's in the mastoid region. Sorry. So the mastoid region, that's the only surface feature I want you to know. Now that process is easy to feel. And know that sternocleidomastoid muscle inserts there. I'm going to show you that muscle. It's a, your big neck muscle that you should know. That muscle there. The sternocleidomastoid. I'm going to isolate it. Uh, helps you turn your head in the opposite direction. So I turn your head to the opposite side, you see the muscle pops out. Okay. Know that muscle. It's named for its attachments. The mastoid is where it inserts. Sternocleido refers to what well, you should know, the sternum and the clavicle. So it has the two attachment points down there. What part of the sternum is it attaching to in this picture? The Nubrium. Nubrium and the medial aspect of the clavicle. So that's where it originates yeah. from. Okay, and it does move the head. Big neck muscle. Sternal clidal mastoid. Okay, uh, there's the petrous region. So I'm gonna go back, turn off muscles here. Go back to the temporal bone, I isolate it and uh, Let's kind of talk about the, the petrous region. Petrous means rocky. It's kind of rocky and it points inward. I'm going to put it back in the skull. So I'm going to uh, fade others. So this is the region that's internal. There's a superior view. You can see the petrous region is the part that's kind of sticking in, helping to form part of the cranial base. Okay. Uh, petrous region. There's, there's a lot of structures there in the petrous region. I have a highlighted there in purple. Now the surface feature here, there's a couple of holes. There's a foramen and a canal. Now there's two holes right here. The students always misidentify these. There's a hole here. Kind of the hole kind of goes this way. And there's a hole that kind of opens backwards. This one's the jugular foramen. That's the carotid canal. No both. What's first? Jugular foramen or fossa. Yeah. jugular foramen if I ask you to identify that hole in the skull, the whole skull. If the bone is disarticulated, it needs to form that hole with the occipital bone that's next to it. So just by itself, it doesn't really make a hole. It makes half of a hole. It's called a fossa. That's why I have in your study guide both terms. It depends if it's in the whole skull or not. Okay, so let me highlight that hole again. This is the jugular foramen or fossa. 
just that hole there. It's an incomplete hole, right? Because it's just by itself. So again, just by itself, no label, it's just a fossa. But if I put it back into the skull, you look at the cranial base there, I can see it, okay? Just a little bit. So what we're looking at here are two holes. This one and this one. I'm teaching you this one right now. That's the jugular forebit. What hole is that? It's the big one. Frame and magnum. So this one, what comes out of here uh, is the um, internal jugular vein. right here above it, it opens kind of, it goes that way, is the carotid canal. Carotid, that's how it's spelled, it's pronounced carotid, it's spelled carotid. I don't know why. But um, there's an artery called um, the internal carotid artery that enters there. on the blood vessels so you can kind of see those things getting out of there. So if it's red, it's an artery. So we illustrate that. You can see that artery going right through that hole, the carotid canal. That's super important. You know, there's only two blood vessels that enter the skull to supply blood to the brain, and this is one of them, the ICA. Now the reason why I say enters is because I'm talking about the direction that blood flows. I say the artery enters because blood enters to supply blood to the brain. And of course you can appreciate how important that is. What do you call lack of blood flow to the brain and the brain tissue dies? Stroke, okay? lack of blood flow. You turn on veins. Okay, let me move, remove the arteries. There you go. So you see the, the veins come out of that other hole? Jugular foramen. I say exits because blood is leaving. The veins drain the brain and return it to the, fill in the blank, heart. Yeah, blood returns to the heart so blood can repump it. The heart can't pump blood unless it first receives it, right? So you learn about that in 431. But anyways, that's why I say exits. That. So those two vessels, the internal jugular vein and the internal carotid artery, the two main vessels of the neck. That's important that you need to know. And the other muscle I want you to know. You see how the sternocleidomastoid is kind of like a landmark to find those vessels? It's an important trick for embalmers. If they have an obese subject and they can't see nothing, if they can find that bump, the mastoid process, and they follow the muscle down this way, oh yeah, you're still alive, so you can feel your pulse. All right? You're feeling right there, just medial to the SCM. So that's important anatomy. Uh, I know it's not really the bone, part of the bone lecture, but I do want you to know those blood vessels. They exit the skull. Okay. So when you feel the pulse, 
Which vessel is it of those two, the artery or the vein? It be the artery. Artery is pulsing. Mm -hmm. You'll learn about it again. Don't worry about that now. But uh, these are basic things that you should start to think about. Because I guess you're in this class because you want to go in the medical field, right? Right. I mean, did any of you like want to be an English teacher? <laughs> My mom took anatomy and she wanted to teach. She just did, took anatomy because she wanted to get her science requirement out of the way in one class. And boy, she regretted it and the class killed her. Uh, but I think most of you want to go in the medical field, so start thinking about these things. And, and don't be like, why is he telling me things I don't need to know now? Uh, you need to know it all. Trust me. I, I, I've worked with doctors. If you show them that you don't know something, it's not going to be very good for you. Maybe some of you want to be the doctor. Why don't you just be the doctor? You don't have to worry about it. We're going to medical school. That'd be better. I'm done with um, those holes. There's two more things there. I want to go back to that cranial bone. Uh, yeah. Isolate it. I want to look on the inside of it. Okay. There's a little hole on the inside of the petrous region. Now that's called, I highlighted it in light purple there, that's called the internal acoustic meatus. Now that one, students have trouble with that one. I don't know why. You never have trouble with the external one because that's where you insert the Q-tip. Everyone knows where that is. But the one on the inside is harder for students to remember for some reason. So we're still in the petrous region. Oh, just to get back to my comment about you want to go in the medical field. My, my first job teaching anatomy in SoCal, my supervisor, professor, told me every time he went to the hospital, he saw his students. And that freaked me out. I was like, oh, I got to see you guys when I go to the hospital. And so he told me a, a useful thing that I should mention to you. Okay, you're going to finish this class. Some of you are happy. Some of you are disgruntled. Uh, this class is very demanding, and it demands a lot of you. But I want you to remember one thing years later when you're a nurse or a doctor or whatever, uh, you got an A and you were my favorite student. Okay, just remember that. Because if I'm unconscious on the gurney and you're the dude watching me, I want you to remember that. Okay? That's what he told me and I thought that was useful. Because you guys are all going to be out there and I'm going to be served by you. Okay? Every time we went to the hospital, he saw his students. I was like, oh, no. I better be nice. Okay. I want you to know the internal acoustic meatus. Oh, let me re isolate that. That little hole. I'm going to zoom in on that. That's the internal acoustic meatus. Cranial nerve 8 exits there. <laughs> So I want you to know that for a cranial nerve that exits. I also have middle cranial fossa on your study guide. That one's harder to show, middle, middle cranial fossa. Let me see if I can just remove the parietal bones. I'm going to highlight the temporal bone. And a fossa is a depression. I'm going to draw where the depression is that I want you to see. Kind of right here. This fossa is the middle cranial fossa. And it's a depression formed by two bones, the temporal bone as well as, as, well as the sphenoid. formed by temporal and sphenoid bones.
and it supports the temporal lobes of the brain. <clears throat> Well, let's take our break, um, and let's come back and we'll do sphenoid and ethmoid, okay?